Good morning. Good morning. We have been studying from the book of James, as Randy said earlier, in our Bible classes, and then I get to talk about uh, the same kind of topic here. So grab your Bibles, the book of James, verse 19. We're going to go there right quickly. Uh, it's so good to have you here today to work, uh, work and worship with this family. We have so many people doing so many things in the kingdom. And, uh, you know, just seeing Marvin over here uh, today to think about the 14 years that he was serving this church as a shepherd. Uh, man, that's a, that's a lot of work. I mean, it's a lot of prayer going up for us, and don't we need it? So thank you, uh, Marvin, and all you elders for, uh, for working and, and helping this church to become what God intends for it to be. Uh, this is the holiday season, so I thought I'd start out with an appropriate slide. I don't know if you've been on a, uh, a diet yet, but uh, after this season, you may want to be. I wanted to show you uh, the top, something like 15 diets. Can you read that enough? Uh, there are whatever kind of diet you want, you can have. There it is. Uh, my father loved uh, knowing about the, the way down diet. There was one that's not on the list. It's a few years back. The way down diet. He preferred the lay down diet. <laughs> That's the one he liked the most. Uh, I had a, uh, a neighbor uh, who was so excited about this new contraption that was, it looked like a lawn chair. Maybe some of you have it in your house. Looks like a lawn chair and you get in it and it kind of does this, you know, kind of folds up and down. And she said, uh, it is a fantastic workout program. The problem is every time I get in it, I go to sleep. As you look at all of the diet possibilities that you have for this coming year, uh, by the way, that's the number one thing that people note, that they're going to do new. As a new year rolls around, I'm going to be on a different kind of diet. <coughs> Excuse me. But out of all of those things, it takes a little bit of work for it to work. You know what I'm saying? For a diet to work, you have to work the diet. You have to actually push yourself away from the table. You have to actually get up and walk around. You have to actually do the program in order for it to work. As we get into this book of James, we'll see clearly that he knows that the kind of faith that we all need to have is the kind of faith that's going to work. But in order for the faith to work, then you have to work the faith. Does that make sense to you? The kind of faith that works, works. That's why we want to encourage everybody just to get involved in the kingdom of God. Get involved serving somebody. Get involved helping somebody. We have something like 45 different ministries going on all the time. And if I were to start naming all the people that are, are in those ministries, I might name almost everybody here. Because we've all caught on to this fever of, yes, we want to be a part of what God is doing. And so we, we work, we, we put our faith to work, and that works for us. That's why we remain faithful. That's why we remain people that are going to honor God the rest of our life, because we put our faith to work. And here's what the passage of the day says. Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourself, but do what it says. We're going to have our reading now. Come on up, Larry, if you will. Uh, this is verse 19 through the end of the chapter. I love to read long sections of Scripture because I think they are much more important than anything I will have to say. You all were saying amen under your breath right now, and I'm glad you did. Come on up, Larry. Listen to the words of God. Through James, chapter 1, 19, through the end of the chapter. I'll be reading New King James, King James Version. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. 
Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflowing of wickedness, and receive with meekness the planted word which is able to save your soul. But he but be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is not a man observing the natural face of the earth. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not forgetful here, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. To visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspoiled from the world. Thank you, Larry. Appreciate that. I am a grandpa. Um, I have three grandchildren. Of course, they're the smartest and the most beautiful grandchildren on the planet. And I have one more on the way, coming in February. And so we're not going to see LeVon for the next six months. <laughs> the other day, my three-year-old uh, granddaughter was at our house. And she began to say a word that was kind of ugly to her older brother. And, and we said, Millie, you know, that's not a good thing to say. We don't want you to say that word about your brother. And she had this stark look on her face like, if I say it, and she said, if I say it again, am I going to get vinegar? Now, we had to decipher that. We called her mom. What does she mean? Well, if she says something bad, I put some vinegar on her tongue. <laughs> And she hates that, and she knows to not to say that word anymore. And so then we hung up the phone, and we said, yes, you're going to get vinegar. <laughs> no, I'm not going to say the word anymore. And then she turned right around, and she said it again. And you know what we had to do? No, don't bring me, don't give me vinegar. Don't. LaVon got a little piece of tissue, touched a little drop of vinegar. She stuck out her tongue, and before she could even, she was just beside herself, crying and weeping away like we had beat the child, and touched it on her tongue. Oh, it was the worst day ever. She never said that word again. Some of you can identify. Do you remember the days when we used to wash our, I, I mean, put, put soap on a tooth, pay to brush and, and wash your child's mouth out with soap. Are you guys still doing that? Anybody doing that? Viva la soap. Bring it on. James starts out his book, and by the way, he talks about the tongue and the, 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 the violence that it can cause in chapter 1, in chapter 2, in chapter 3, in chapter 4, in chapter 5. The bad that it can do and the good that it can do, he talks about it through his whole little letter. As if to say, unless, church, unless we get this part down about taming our tongues, we will never have the influence for Christ that he wants. Let me say that again. James is saying that unless we learn to control our tongues, we will never be the influence that God intends for us to be. This is a hard one because James later on says nobody can really tame the tongue. But it's interesting that he gives over and over again the chance and the opportunity and even instruction on how to do that. Remember last week we talked about this, the first work in the faith that works diet. Remember this last week he said, ask God for wisdom. This is what we need to begin to ask him for, wisdom in everything, absolutely. But wisdom in how to use our tongues, how to use our words. 
And here's what he says. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask you, God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. Maybe we need to start asking wisdom on how we use our words, because that's the second thing he says. The second work in the faith that works diet is first listen, then speak, and then keep calm. Be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. That word produce, it does not reveal the righteousness of God. Somebody said it like this. James is saying we need to control our tongues. In our society today, we need to control our tongues, and we need to control our thumbs. Do you know what I'm talking about? I know people who have lost jobs because of what they texted. I have first-hand knowledge of people who have not gotten jobs because of what they wrote on their Facebook page. We need to guard our tongues and guard our thumbs for sure. And let me just take a little side note since this is the political uh, craziness that, that we're experiencing now. The minute, let me try to say this right. The minute you say angry, nasty, ugly things about the other party that you don't identify with, you have just cut off your Christian witness to half of America. And I've seen your Facebook pages, that's why I say that. You have just cut off your spiritual influence to half of America. Be careful, be wise about what you say and about what you type. It makes all the difference. The work of controlling our words, Solomon says this, if anyone gives an answer before he hears, it's his folly and his shame. Whoever restrains his words has knowledge. Even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is deemed intelligent. Man, my daddy told me this verse every week, I think. <laughs> Jerry, you just need to be quiet. Because every time you open your mouth, everybody knows how intelligent you are. And it's not very. In fact, that was right before he would say, Are you smart enough to know how dumb you are? <laughs> now, I say that because I love my dad. And he was always a jokester. But he was always careful with his words. Finally, Solomon says, A person's words can be life-giving water. Words of true wisdom are as refreshing as a bubbling brook. Now here's what we might say today. Seek first, people. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. Have you ever got getting in that situation where before somebody even finishes their sentence, you want to jump in there and give them your two cents? You ever do that? Put the brakes on that. Back the truck up just a little bit. Seek first to understand what somebody's trying to say before you jump in there with your two cents. And then after they get finished, then be understood. We have two ears and one mouth. We should listen twice as much as we talk. That's true, isn't it? We are called to be slow to speak and quick to listen. Here's another one. I have never learned anything while I was talking. You ever thought about that? I've never learned anything while I was talking. Man, we want to learn God's way primarily. We can't do it while we're talking. So let's listen. Be people who are listeners. Let your spouse finish talking before you talk. If you do this... You may not ever get a chance to talk, which may be probably best, or you may actually understand what your spouse is saying. What a novel idea. Let them finish their sentence at least before you talk. Be, be quick to listen. Slow to speak. Here's what Proverbs says. Pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul, and healing to the bones. Proverbs 16. Here's what Ephesians says. Don't let any wholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to the needs. That it may benefit those who listen. Are the words that come in, that are coming from your mouth, do they benefit people? Do, the, do people go away encouraged by being in your presence? 
Do they go out away thinking more highly of themselves than they did before they come into your presence? Or do they go away and believe that they don't ever want to talk to you because of how they have been made to feel? Don't let any wholesome, unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. The only thing is to build up other people. That's easy, right? Woo, that's hard. When you decide that you're going to try to control your tongue in a way that James was talking about, I guarantee you are going to find more silence in your life than you have ever had before. And you have to stop and think about the words you're saying or typing before you say them. Silence will rule. Here's a few uh, things to think about before you communicate with anybody. You got to think about it. Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? And is it coming? What I think is on the left-hand side. You kind of understand that, don't you? I can think all kind of things. But I'm going to be careful with what I say. Because I am representing Christ. Let me say that again. I am representing Christ in all that I say and all that I do. That's why James says uh, over and over again, consider the, consider the words that you say, the way you communicate. I think it's interesting that God said um, something so clearly. And, and he said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased, right? Do you know the one way that Jesus is described in, in Scripture, especially in John? In the beginning was the word. The word, the communication, the word, the word that was with God and the word that was God. The only way you can clearly be known is by your word. Now, I can say to somebody, uh, you know, I, I know, I know Bill pretty well. Uh, I know that I want to have him over for lunch sometime. But wait a minute, I don't know whether he drinks tea or coffee or a nice Dr. Pepper. I don't know. And so I, I, somebody would ask, do you know him? Well, I really don't know him. How am I going to get to know him? I'm going to go visit with him and say, Bill, what do you like? Come over. I'm going to make some tea for you. No, I don't like tea. I'm going to have some, co some, some coffee for you. No, I don't like coffee. How about Dr. Pepper? And he was shaking his head like, yeah, that's what I like. I have talked with him. I've communicated with him. And I know firsthand he's a Dr. Pepper man. When we speak, People get to know us just like God intended when he sent Christ so that we could get to know him. And that's why Christ is called the word of God, the words that I give you, the words that Christ is, the communication of God. That's why our talk is so important. That's how we will be known. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, my strength and my redeemer. That's one way that we walk worthy. I want to show this one more time. I've got two short stories to tell you, and then I'm finished. I talked with a person just this last week who 50 years ago, his father called him lazy. Fifty years ago, that one word that his dad said to him stuck with him. He still remembered the conversation. He remembered what he was doing or what he wasn't doing. And that word stuck in his heart. My father called me lazy. Now, he had been a great productive man who's done fantastically financially with a Christian family and his children are Christians. And this great man accomplished so much. In his heart of hearts, he was scarred by that word. Our words have power, don't they? They can scar people. Even if we flippantly say something, they can scar people deep. We don't want to be people that scar people with our words. 
heard this on the radio just the other day. It's a story of a, of a lady, and she tells her own story. In 1998, she woke up in the middle of the night in a ball on her carpet of her apartment, totally wasted on drugs, with her one-year-old in the crib behind her. And all she could think about was, where am I going to get my next kid? She knew her husband had left the apartment and he was out trying to find more drugs, hopefully to bring it back to her, but she knew him. She knew he was not going to. And she, she was just in pain and in anguish and, and she needed some kind of relief and all she could think about was that next kid and then she glanced at that child. I know this is not what I should be doing. But she remembered that her mother had tucked a piece of paper in her hand and she would get that out and open it and read it and crumple it back up and <clears throat> just in pain and didn't know how to get out of this. Finally, two o'clock in the morning, she opened up that paper and she, she found the numbers to the counselor that her mother had said, please call this guy, please call this guy. <coughs> After debating for a while, she finally found the phone and was able to pick it up and call. And it was 2 o'clock in the morning, and, and, and a man answered the phone on the other end, and hello, and she could tell he was just waking up at 2 in the morning. Hello, and, and she said, I'm sorry to disturb you. I, just, I had your number, and, and I just, you know, I, I was told you could help. And, and so he, she could tell he was getting up, and she could hear the, the sheets kind of roll back, and, and he was wanting to give her his full attention. And she began to tell him of her life and all the troubles and all the scars that her parents had given to her, even though she was a scholar student, finished her degree, master's also, and, and yet he listened patiently. And, and she kept talking about her husband, how who abused her sometimes and all, the, all, all of that, but she wanted to do something different. And he listened. And he had a few words of kindness to say, but all she could do was remember the, the fact that he was just listening. And, and, so, and so they talked and they talked and they talked and mostly she talked and, and complained and she cried and he was kind and he was gentle. And, and, and then it was six o'clock in the morning and she said, the sun started to come in my window and I realized I'd been talking to this guy since two o'clock in the morning. And so she said, thank you for listening to me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this the day that I began to do better. Thank you for listening in. And she said, now wait a minute. I got to know. How, you're so good to listen to me and the words that you said are kind to me. And How long have you been a Christian counselor? She asked. He said, well, I was hoping that you wouldn't ask that because the number that you dialed was the wrong number. <laughs> she had misdialed the number and this was just a generic Christian man who was willing to listen. In a world of darkness, there is a, if there's a pinhole of light coming through, everyone's gravitating to it. And we live in a world of darkness that people are wanting something encouraging to come their way that they can grab onto. It may be that we just need to learn to listen. Just listen to people. That will help them. But if we have kind, encouraging words, words from God himself, you're my child. You're made in my image. I love you and cannot stop loving you. If we can use those words as we listen and as we speak, we can change the world and we can change our community. God knew what he was doing when he told James to write this down. This is how we start on this diet of of working your faith, control that tongue. Be someone who says good things 
and not things that tear people down. Be somebody that encourages and doesn't abuse. And if you can't do that, we'll have to do what my mother said. She's in the audience. She'll correct me if I'm wrong. She said, if you can't find anything nice to say, find something nice to say. The other copy. Because we've been so blessed by God, we've got a lot of good things to say, don't we? God bless you this week as you encourage each other and encourage those who need God. Let's stand, church, and let's sing together this song. Jesus Christ calls us.